My name is Chloe Fuyu, and I'm from the University of Uvascular, Finland. Welcome to the Graphics Data-Driven Storytelling Workshop. If you don't want to watch the entire workshop in the two hours that it took to record, you can jump ahead in this YouTube video. If uh, you just want to get straight into the code along, you can jump to part one at 22 minutes, which is going to be dealing with box plots, color, and statistical summaries. If you want instead to do more advanced customization of part two, about an hour in, we'll be doing uh, faceting, um, dealing with regression lines, and investigating some more custom color. Finally, uh, if you want to just jump into part three, there we are dealing with master visualization, where we're going to be importing photos, adding significant stars, and really just tying up um, figures into a story. Thank you so much for joining, and I hope you enjoy. All right, uh, wonderful. <laughs> this is the power of R. All of these graphs have been made 100% in R. And this is just to show you how powerful, powerful of a tool this can be when you can use it to its full capacity, dealing with spatial data, dealing with huge categorical and continuous sets, manipulating color and geometry. It's all part of a really wonderful and beautiful story that we can use and create using R. And so I think taking a step to just look at one of the big data visualization names, his name is Cedric Scherer, and creating all of these these visualizations, this this data, it's it's pretty remarkable that we have equal access to this information. Not only that, but these uh, plots are all made from something we call Tidy Tuesday. So every Tuesday, all these big coders will follow a kind of a theme of the week, and we all make a, a plot based on that theme. And then everyone shares their code, so you could reproduce any of those graphs if you just go on Cedric Scherer's GitHub and copy the code, paste it in R, because that's what R is about. So I've introduced you to what R can do, but let's talk a little bit more about data visualization. Why is data visualization important? Why are figures important? It's so much more than just you know your most recent article. Um, so this is actually an article written in the New York Times in 2016. And so it, the whole, article was about our democracy is stable. Recently, it seems that there's a tragic decline in people's trust of democracies. And if you look at this graph, the initial impression is quite alarming. I mean, it's well labeled. Um, there's even, you know, these confidence intervals are, are mentioned. And it really seems that if we look at the percentage of people who say it's essential to live in democracy, like, wow, what this is what what's going on here? The New York Times is right. Like, what's going on? always ask about the components of your graph. So let's dissect this graph a little bit and see if it's really as honest as it's coming off us. When we look at the x-axis, we see the decade of birth. And it looks like this, you know, by the points connected by a line, that this is a longitudinal study. But when you actually read the article, you'll find that everyone was asked this question on the same day. So it's a little bit misleading to say that people's trust in a democracy is degrading over time if everyone is asked the question on the same day. So perhaps with these, this kind of data, using a slope kind of line, which is showing change over time, is not really appropriate. And then the second and kind of more troubling aspect of this graph is that it's coded as a yes or no. Um, is it essential to live in a democracy? You would think the way that question is asked, yes, it is, or no, it's not. Turns out, when you look at this data, which is freely available, which was asked by the World Value Survey, the question was actually on a 1 to 10 scale, not a yes or no scale. So here, yes, which is 10, is marked as absolutely important. But what about the people who ranked democracies as a 9 out of 10, which was coded as very important? Like, in this graph, they're coded as no. So. When someone went through the trouble of recoding these data, we get the, the graph on the right. If you look at the Netherlands here, uh, looks pretty stable to me versus, you know, here we have 50%, you know, declining to a little over 30%. And, you know, there's definitely perhaps a, a, a decline, but 
I wouldn't say that when you really take the full scope of the data and you respect it and plot it honestly, it's probably not that big of a story to make it to the New York Times. So, you know, maybe democracy will live another day. <laughs> and the whole point of this is just to show how important it is to understand the graphs you're making because it can be very misleading and have profound effects if you use them incorrectly. With that, Let's talk about the kind of graphs you can make. <laughs> there are so many options. You've got you know, your bar plots, you've got your dot plots, you can make density distributions, violin plots, strip charts, uh, you, heat maps, density plots, and you can model pretty much anything you dare to think about. <laughs> and you can mix and match these as well. Model fits, distributions, counts, different relationships. Pretty much your imagination is you know, the limit to what you can create. And this is really facilitated through R, especially for us ecologists and evolutionary biologists, creating plots and showing data is kind of like a really big part of our job. And as you can see through this, uh, this little GIF, we can move from a pretty simple box plot to a really beautiful strip chart that's communicating the same data but it's nice to be visually appealing. It grabs your audience, it tells a story, and it can really show the importance of what you're trying to communicate. If I haven't already shown you and made you fall in love with data visualization already, let me tell you why it's important to look at data beyond the numbers. This is a really famous um, data set called Enscom's Quartet. And all of these data, all these sets have the exact same mean and the exact same correlation to that regression line. But, so if I looked at a table, I'd say, oh yeah, like take any of the model fits, it's fine. Once you, once you plot it, you say, oh wow, the nature of these data are so different. And you would have never seen that. You would have never understood that if you hadn't looked at them. This was done in a little more of a, a fun way <laughs> in 2017 uh, with a pretty famous data set called Datasaurus. Um, and so again, these ones all have the same mean, the same standard deviation, and the same correlation, just really showing that numbers tell a good part of the story, but looking at your information is also vital to understanding the story that you're going to try to tell. So that has led me down a, a path of data visualization. Um, I'm still relatively new to it, but I think that it's something that's just so fun and so accessible that it's something that you can get pretty proficient at pretty quickly if, if you get into it. So the three big questions I've come to ask as I've started really ingesting graphs and understanding visual data are these. First question, is it pretty? <laughs> Which sounds so silly, but no one wants to look at an ugly graph. And that's just a fact. Um, is it correct? Now this is one's a little bit more profound. Is the way you're showing your data visually correct? Now, if this echoes back to the New York Times example, showing that change over time is a slope is probably missing that answer. The answer to that question is probably no. And then the third one is perceptual. Is it obvious? Are the differences you're trying to show here obvious? And that's like a really kind of core graph tenant here, if we look at the left here, if we think about these questions and then shape them into the official perceptual lenses, which is aesthetic, substantive, and perceptual, let's ask these questions about the graph to the left. Is it pretty? I don't think so. Um, I think the color scheme is whack. I think the shade is like unnecessary. Is it correct? It's not obvious if it's correct or not, and that's a problem. Because you know, when you look at data, you should be able to say, oh yes, this is what it's measuring. This is how it should look. I'm not really sure what's going on here. I don't know. Perceptual, is it obvious? Um, well, <laughs> graphing in three dimensions already is, tends to always be kind of a not good idea. But you know, if we're comparing the heights of these bar charts, I, I, I don't know what's going on, especially in the lower hematocrit groups. So, you know, hold these questions in your heart and let's actually use these to take about 30 seconds to look at this graph. I want <laughs> us to look in the in the in the chat, please comment, you know, how would you 
improve this graph? You know, what, what could you do? So this is kind of one of the first things that happens when you start getting the toolbox in R. And I definitely fell into this trap of just because I can do it doesn't mean I should, you know? So when we think about the alphabetical order, right, yeah. So again, you guys pretty much touched it. It has a weird scale, the colors are weird, the font is unnecessary, what's up with the shading? Why is it in 3D? <laughs> The information shouldn't be, you know, maybe in decreasing or increasing order would make that perception better to see. Hit the nail on the head on that one. So again, I'll say it because I'm the, I'm the leader of the workshop, but <laughs> yeah, the 3D shadow is completely unnecessary. Um, the like years, the way that's shown is kind of strange. Again, papyrus and like a textured background, like it's a vibe, but I don't think it's the right vibe. Um, and so this is something we call in data viz chart junk. It's junk. It's filling up space. It's wasting ink. It's not really necessary to communicate the story you're trying to tell. And so that leads us to these perceptual channels. We're going to take another 30 seconds. And the task of this beautiful slide is to find the golden circle. I know. All right, I'm going to do it too. Um, so we're going to start here. Ah, there it is. I'm going to look over here. Ah, found it again. All right, let's move on to the next one. Yep. Move over here. Yep. All right, let's mix both color and shape. Wait, where is it? <laughs> yep. Okay. So <laughs> what are we learning here? Turns out that our brains are not like super good at processing a lot of information that are queuing from different visual or perceptual channels at the same time. This is actually why when you take a class and your lecturer or professor is showing you a PowerPoint screen and also talking, you're either looking at the PowerPoint screen or listening to them lecture because we kind of work in these binaries, right? So when we are thinking about perceptual channels in our graph, mixing up color and shape is like always just a bad call if you're trying to highlight information or to really distinguish information. So the first takeaway here is that when we code data, when we're showing information visually, when we're trying to highlight a subset of our information, stick to one channel. I personally, just my own little whacked up brain, um, color really works for me. My eye is immediately drawn to that. That's also because in this example, I use complementary colors. So, you know, that's another <laughs> thing we'll get into, but be mindful of that. The second thing that people tend to fall into is using different kinds of graph types that are unnecessary because you can use them. <laughs> so in a, a recent study, uh, looking at the interpretation accuracy of graphs. So just like can you see what the graph is actually telling, just trying to tell you, you know? Um, they asked both laymen and scientists alike. And it turns out we really suck at interpreting angles and areas. Perceptually, the human eye is just bad at comparing areas. And so when it comes to pie charts, when it comes to these like interesting bubble area charts that are kind of the, the new frontier of data viz, they're actually really prone to interpretation error. And it turns out we're the best at interpreting information that's on a similar axis, so on a common scale. So if we're interpreting position, we seem apparently to be much better at doing that. So if we have complex data, probably working with bar charts or things that use a singular common access, axis um, is the best way to show this information. All right, so this is gonna now take us onto our R journey. Um, like all programming languages, I think Healy said it best, R does it exactly what you tell it to do, which is not always what you want it to do. <laughs> um, and I think that's a really beautiful and really painful way of thinking of R because for me, that's been exactly true. So let's move a little bit into what R syntax looks like. So this is not a great plot. I'm just gonna tell you that right now. <laughs> this is not a great plot, but it does include all the parts of syntax that I wanna go over here. So deal with it. <laughs> all right, so here's the code for this not great plot. All right, so as we know, hopefully, 
when we start creating a plot, we have our data set. That's fine. We call our data. That's kind of like the point of making a plot. Next, we have AES. How many of you guys know that AES is not a random string of letters? It actually stands for aesthetics. This will be the aesthetics of your plot. What is whatever is in these parentheses is going to be pulling from your data sheet. So for example, on the x axis here, I've defined my x as species, which is taking that species column from my data. The y is sepal length, which again is taking that sepal length information from my data. So anything within this AES has to be from your data frame. If it's not, R is going to print you out something super weird. And <laughs> if you don't add it, it's not going to be able to find it because it's going to be like, where, where is this species? What, what is this about? The next thing, which is like a very common error, is that sweet, sweet plus. It just connects the lines. That's all it does. But it's so funny because you just have to put it at the end of the line, just literally at the end of every line. But it can be easy to lose them. Sometimes they like end up weird places when you like delete lines of code. So rule of thumb, the plus connects lines connects functions, more importantly. I did this here. Um, here you'll see I actually split my line with a parentheses and, well, sorry, with a comma, Oof, um, with a comma. And that's okay, because everything is within that function of, of within those parentheses. But after that, after every function, you see a plus, those connect the lines. Cool. Next thing we have, quotation marks the bane of every beginning ggplotter's existence because there are two species of quotations. There are non-defined character strings, which essentially means that any letters that you have within these quotations don't mean anything. And you could be like, why would I ever wanna use something that doesn't mean anything? Well, that's like the label for your axes, you know? So anything I print within this, these quotations is going to print exactly what I write. So it's important to be careful with that because if you make a spelling error, R, you've told R, like, this is just some nonsense. These are just letters. So be very careful with what goes into your non defined character strings. This, of course, is then countered with defined character strings, which is, you know, so sad because you just were like, okay, anything within quotations doesn't mean anything, except sometimes it does. So here I've used uh, legend position equals none. Uh, and that's in quotations because none within legend position means something. So within that function, that has been defined. If I use a capital N, like none with a capital N, nothing would happen. So the way you kind of tell these differences between defined and non-defined character strings is that the ones that are defined um, will often come after a function call. So there will be a very specific function that's related to something you're trying to do. And then you can always look at the help help bar, which we will do, um, and just see what kind of options are even available to help you. <laughs> all right, so that's kind of our beginner syntax. And that's really all you'll need to know for today. Let me talk to you about ggplot in a more abstract way. You are an artist. You are a visionary. ggplot is a blank canvas, you know? Your vision, it's there for you. When I draw on this canvas, I draw my mountains and then I draw my trees, you know? But you don't draw your trees and then try to draw your mountains behind it. You don't draw your clouds and think, oh man, I wanted a sun behind, you know? You, you, the order of how you're painting your landscape matters. And thus, the order of your code matters because it will run, but it will paint you exactly in the order that you painted the lines of code. Let me illustrate. These two graphs have the exact same code. What happened? Why does one on the left look so messed up? Well, it's because R did it exactly what I told it to do, not what I wanted it to do. So for example, here I painted my points and above my painted points, I said, oh, please give me a violin distribution. Well, guess what? You, you got exactly that. The violin distribution is now on top of your points and it's gone. Another one that's a little bit trickier comes with themes. 
So for example, here I said, hey, you know, set my theme to black and white. I like the minimalist vibe. And on top of that, please remove my legend. If I invert these, if I say, hey, remove my legend, and then I say, oh, also black and white. Well, this black and white theme has a legend in it. So it's gonna paint the legend back on, which is what you're seeing here on the, on the right. So it can be so frustrating when your code is running and everything's supposed to look the way it does. And sometimes all it is is that your lines just got jumbled up. And I know that's so frustrating. So what's important is just to go line by line. You can run your code, kind of see the graph updating and make sure that nothing is getting lost in your artistic vision. With that, I kind of want to close saying that our works using packages and these packages facilitate different tasks. I add some packages are really specific to data visualization, ggplot, ggforce. Some of them are really important to data import, importing images, importing dates and times, which is like notoriously awful to work with. And some of them are just about wrangling your data, about making sure your data looks the right shape which prepares it to be graphed or to do whatever you whatever you please. So before we take our quick little break here, I just want to show you guys, give you a little taste of what there is to look forward to. So by the end of this first part of code, we are gonna start with this basic bleh, box plot, ugly, stupid, useless, don't need that energy in my life. We are gonna to move to a beautiful point range. Oh, we're gonna talk about box plots. We're gonna talk about color versus fill, shapes, sizes, points, jitter, custom colors, statistical summaries, got you. Next part, advanced customization. We're gonna start with a scatter plot. Blech. Move on to a super customized, faceted regression line. I will actually admit right now, this is not the cutest plot that has ever existed, but it is customized from tip to tail. Your regression lines, your themes, your text, your background, your axis, your faceting. We're gonna go through that. Finally, that master visualization. We're gonna start with just some, whatever this situation is. <laughs> And then we're gonna move on to this. We're gonna do violin plots, scene plots, significant stars, images. We're gonna do it all. All right, so I've gone on long enough. I wanted to leave you guys on this for the next uh, five-ish minutes while we open up our R. Uh, all of these resources are completely free um, and they are just, really great and super accessible. Here are the, you know, I'll post the, the slides after this um, and then, you know, whatever you guys want, you can screen grab this, I don't care. So the way we're gonna be coding today is line by line, which means that I'm not gonna be jumping ahead of you guys. Whatever you see on this little, little square, I will see. Um, and so, Hopefully this will help us really stay in sync. No one will get lost. And again, I have the duo Sarahs, <laughs> Sarah Karim and Sarah Hochevar, helping out any car, car uh, code trouble you guys are having. So as promised, we will go briefly through installing our packages. A quick way to do this is to first see where the heck your working directory is. Can you guys see my whole R? Yeah, 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 awesome. So you're gonna see my working directory right now is set to my user Chloe Fuyu, wherever that is. I don't really know where that is, right? So let me define where that is. If you guys already have a nice working directory and you have your packages loaded, like don't do this. It's just gonna create like more trouble for you. But you know, let's let's do it for the sake of a teaching moment here. So I'm setting my working directory. I copied and paste, whoopsie daisy. Well, let's, I'm just gonna copy this because I don't really know <laughs> what this means. So as you can see, it's in quotations, it's users dash Chloe for you. I just want it to be on my desktop. You know, the code can be there, it can live there and that's fine. Let's do that. 
And now it, it ran down here. Looks okay. Let's look now. We can double check. Ah, perfect. So now my R, 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 R is uh, working and grabbing all the files from the desktop. So if I have any images to import, if my data sheet is like hanging around, all of that stuff should be on your desktop. And now also we can install some packages. So let's do that. We do install that packages. We start with a C. Uh, C means concatenate, which is kind of a dumb word. Uh, the way I think of it is it just glues a bunch of things together. So what we can do with concatenating is that we can glue a bunch of calls together. So we can say, hey, install ggplot, comma, install ggforce, great. Let's install Dippler. Oh, guys, Dippler, such a vibe, so nice. Uh, ggsignif, this is what we're gonna use to add our significant starts to our plots. Um, here's a fun thing. when. My code gets too long. I like it really just to be kind of on, on my screen. You can uh, do a comma here. And again, as I said in the lecture, as long as it's kind of housed with these parentheses, you'll be fine. You can keep on. I could start writing down here if I wanted to. You know what? I am just for the vibe here. Let's just do that. Just to, just to prove to you. Uh, PNG, uh, that's going to upload our pictures for us. And then HMISC is this really cool package that does a bunch of cool statistical summaries. So. My lines are technically connected. They're technically bound within these parentheses. Let's run it. Updating load. Do I want to restart R? I don't, but it will now install these packages. Um, and so uh, as you guys saw here, see this little stop? Well, it, it appears now and again, but uh, yeah, when the little stop sign thingy appears, don't mess with it. <laughs> Your computer is thinking, let it think in peace. Um, so yeah, I'm going to now delete that because that was kind of annoying to look at, but just to show. So packages are like a light bulb. You install packages once. You only need one light bulb. Imagine if you changed your light bulb every time you wanted to turn on the light. Oofta, like you don't need that in your life. So you only install packages once, but you have to turn on that light bulb. So you got to call that library every single time. If some of your code isn't running, did you load your library? <laughs> That's like the first question to ask. So we've installed our packages. I'm not seeing the chat like explode with comments. So hopefully <laughs> everyone has loaded their packages. Um, after that, you can just call your, your, your library and it's always good practice. Uh, I'm actually gonna take a, a beat here to talk about clean code because you know it's important. Um, so let's actually talk about that. I always keep all of the packages I load at the top of my script, even if later in, in the code, I'm like, oh man, I could really use this new package. I go up to the top, put it up here because that way you run all your packages at, your, at the beginning of your session and it's done. So we use this hash mark to indicate we are going to, to write words. Anything that is in this hash mark is not code. So it's like, hey, let's load some packages, happy face. Here's another little trick. You can eat, you can add four dashes after that. This now is something we can access anytime. We can jump to this section whenever we want. So let's say I then over here say like graph, graph one, and then I add my four hashes. Now I can jump to the load packages. I could jump to graph one. This obviously isn't super useful right now because we only have 11 lines, but I hope that. Well, we'll use it and you guys will see. So let's go and call our library. Turns out ggplot and R kind of love us. So you should be getting recommendations, hopefully, <laughs> of if, if, if you've run the, the, that package before and saying, hey, Chloe, like, do you mean ggplot too? That's absolutely what I mean, R, thank you. So we're gonna load that. And I'm actually gonna load this line by line because sometimes um, the, Packages sometimes conflict with each other. Sometimes there's some drama. I need to update something. And so it's just good to, I, I like to just load them line by line, make sure everything is healthy. Everything's looking good so far, which is good because that'd be pretty embarrassing if it wasn't. Dippler, 
Turns out we're actually not really going to use Dippler today after some edits I made in the code, but it is, it is a brilliant package and it's good to have. All right, library. Uh, we need ggsignif. Great. Run that. Bam. And like already, I hope you guys are typing and like feeling like you're going to break into the government. It's like, oh, PNG package. Oh, yes. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> and then you're going to see um, here's my last package. And sometimes it'll actually, so, okay. I, I do want to make a word of, I want to make a word. Um, so sometimes you load packages and they load it and like R doesn't have anything to say to you. And like, you know, R is happy, you're happy, you move on with your life. Sometimes R has got some words for you. And this is good to not ignore. <laughs> Don't ignore what R is trying to tell you, you know, you know, be, a, be an active listener, be an open listener. So we see some warning messages here. Hmm, what, what, what does, what does, what's wrong with my package here? It's actually pretty nice. It doesn't really have much to say to me. It just says, hey, Chloe, this is a little bit of a later version of a package. Um, it was built on an earlier version of R. So maybe there's some new things in this newest version I have that aren't compatible. Um, and then that, that's, all, that's, that's all it has to say to me. So actually it's, you know, nothing too, nothing too triggering so far. So, you know, look at your packages. Sometimes they are, or will tell you how to fix the problem like 80% of the time. And you just have to, I know looking at error messages is like super scary. <laughs> so, you know, take the time and just, just read them. All right. So like, here we go. It's so exciting. All right. So R has a bunch of data. Oh, you can also do dashes like this. I like the dashes. I think they're sick. There's a bunch of data loaded into R. And we, when we were deciding, designing this workshop, we were like, how do we minimize <laughs> the errors people are, are going to run into? Um, so if we actually just type whoop, data, it's going to what type it and also enter it. That's important. Um, you're going to see there's actually a bunch of data sets already built into base R. So we have all of these wonderful data sets. And this is really great practice if you're just kind of like messing around and want to see what we're doing uh, or just want to like try something new. You've got like, there was a really fun one about beavers that I was really in for, for a second. It doesn't matter. It's there, trust me. Um, but yeah, you've got a bunch of weird ones. Um, yeah, DNA data set, rat data. Cool, I don't know. I have already decided the data set we're going to be using. So tough luck. Uh, we're going to start with two data sets, but today we're going to start with something that I thought was like super great for Oikos. It's all about knitting, yo. It's called warp breaks. And it ran good because I have misspelled that many a time. So you're going to see it's going to pop up as a promise. And this is just like a weird way to say, R is telling you, hey, like, do you want this data? And then you say, yes, please. And you click on it <laughs> and it's there. Wonderful. Um, so let's kind of just look at it. We can just drop it down. You can see it is a very basic data sheet. There are only three lines on it. We can actually just look at it. Let's just look, let's just look at it. You've got breaks. I don't know what that means. You've got wool, you've got some tension. And here we're gonna use the help function because it's going to just save you so much time in the future. If you want to ask our question, just ask our question. You put a question mark. That's how you start with a question. And then you can say um, warp breaks. Like, what is that? And usually, so you'll see, uh, this is a question that people have asked before. <laughs> R is, again, your friend. Well, it's like more your friend of me, but like in this context, it is your friend. So let's, let's ask warp breaks. And then you'll see popping up on the right here, the number of breaks in yarn during weaving. There you go. See, super Nordic. So we've got two types of wool, A and B. We've got three levels of tension, L, M, and H, which I assume is low, medium, and high. And that's it. Cool. Let's plot some stuff. So let's just go and call this plot one. All right, so we start every gg plot by writing gg plot um great so we are first going to call the data the data is called warp breaks again you will see r is trying to help you um it's like hey is this this one 
this word breaks? And you're like, yes, absolutely. I'm just gonna start clicking on those because I have like a really hard time writing warp breaks for some, for some reason. Okay, now we're gonna define our aesthetics. So what do we want on the X? What do we want on the Y? Well, turns out I've already decided for us. Um, I'm going to have the wool type on the X axis. It seemed like the most intuitive thing. And then of course uh, on our Y, we can really only have breaks because the other one is a categorical variable. So it would just, really make something weird. So actually let's just call this line. It's just a blank plot because that's all that we told R to do, right? It's just, that's, that's all we've said. Just for funsies, don't copy me here. I could do tension. So tension is another factor. So imagine a factor by a factor. What are you gonna get? Just like this really weird matrix because you can only get these like nine options, you see? So. It never really makes sense to do like a factor by a factor plot because then your your data points are only going to be in those possible options. So let's go back to wool. Nope, not wool. Breaks. Yes. Cool. So I've said make my plot look like this. Great. Let's add that plus. We're starting new line. And then I say, hmm, how do I want my data to look? Let's just do some points. These points are defined by geomes. Um, as you can see, there are so, well, you can't see right now, but there are a lot of ways, well, not points, point, that won't run. Um, so let's run that. That's, that's what it looks like. Maybe you've, you know, gotten to this point before in your life and like, that's cool, but like we can, we can go a little more here. Um, so we've done our points. Let's add, let's add a, let's add a box plot. Let me just see. Now, what's going to happen if I paint a box plot on top of my points? I don't know, Chloe. Let's see. Okay, well, guess what? You asked for it. Your box plot is ugly. It's covering all your points. All your data is just lost. Why? Why? Because of the painting thing that you told us about. That's right. Because of the painting thing. It matters, it matters, order matters. So we're gonna add box plot first. See this little weird plus thing going on here? We remove that, we don't need that in our lives. That is negative energy. So we're saying, draw me my box plot, draw me my points. Ah, oh, breath of fresh air, am I right? Um, but like, <laughs> let's be honest, this was like the bit <laughs> plot, it's just so ugly. Um, so, we are going to move away from this like very cautiously like we're moving away from a bomb like let's get away from this box plot the first big issue here are the points like there's a lot of overlap going on i don't really know what you know there's so much going on that um that it's just it's hard to distinguish what is where one way to get around this is by changing your alpha. So your alpha is going to be the point uh, opacity. So how dark your points are. This is on a scale from zero to one. So, and this is not the solution I want, but I'm providing it to you. Tools in a toolbox, baby. So let's change our alpha. Um, let's set it at, I don't know, 0.5. So it's gonna be the half density of the color, whatever. So you can see already, like some of our points, whoopsie daisy. Yeah, some of our points are lighter, some of our darker. The darker ones mean that's, that you have some exact overlap there. Okay, that's like kind of interesting, I guess. That's like kind of a half answer, right? It doesn't really solve our problem. So we're actually gonna get rid of this geom point business, goodbye. What we're gonna use here is controlled random variance and something that's called geom jitter. This is going to jitter your points by introducing kind of some, some a little bit of uh, distortion into your plot, but it's controlled distortion and it really emphasizes. So let's first run it. Okay, so first we see like this is not <laughs> quite what we want. It's just like a giant cloud. But what it does do is that it's able to kind of separate these points along a controlled gradient. So let's let's control the width of this because you can, again, control how much um, distortion you want. 
So let's just set it to something very small, to like 0 0.1. And that's going to tighten up our, our points a little bit. But this really helps us kind of see these different points, right, um, without really being um, dishonest, because all it is is just separating them. And because they're all on that categorical uh, axis, um, it's like, you know, it's not like they're different values. All that matters here is really the y axis, right? So we can also change the size of the points, which is great because all of my advisors are old and they, you know, need help seeing things sometimes. So we're gonna make it a little bit bigger. All right, I'm gonna really pay for that later. <laughs> okay, so we've done our box plot, we've done our jitter. Like if you've made it that far, that's, that's like a pretty good, pretty good vibe. Now I wanna really introduce this concept of stat summaries. These are statistical summaries and they kind of just automatically um, create summary values based on the vectors that are in your data frame and on your plot. So let's say I want to call a function. The function is called fun because it puts the fun in function. <laughs> um, again, you're going to see this is in quotations because these functions have like defined within that within that function there are defined questions you can ask. So we can do the mean, we can do the median. Uh, let's for fun do the median because I think medians really, you know, get forgotten a lot. And I think they're kind of fun. We're also going to do a geome. So we're going to, we're going to define the shape of what we want this median to look like. And let's just say we're already working with, with points, you know, with these circles. So let's, let's just keep this point thing going. Next, we're going to define uh, the size. And so let's make it, oops, let's make it a little bit bigger than the other ones just so we can see. And let's uh, then define a color. So actually, we're not gonna define a color yet. We're just gonna do that. Great, and you can't really see it, right? Because it's black. <laughs> so let's color that point. Let's just color it red so we can like see what's going on here. Okay, that's your median. Makes sense. It's matching up with the box plot. Sounds like the stat summary is doing what it's supposed to do. I'm admittedly very new at the Zoom thing. I'm going to try the points I want to make here is that, first of all, um, point shapes, right? I didn't do this yet because I didn't want to create too much drama here, but you're going to see I'm eventually going to define shape. Right, and shape is going to be a number anywhere from zero to 25. And so just so you guys see, these points have different just shapes in R. They're already pre-coded. I didn't do any magic. Um, and so you can see uh, that uh, they, you know, you can have a solid circle, you can have a filled circle. And again, this difference between fill and solid is very different because it defines what I can do with colors based on color and fill. And we'll get to that later. Put a little, put a little pin in that. Um, the other thing I want to get to is color. So color is fabulous. Um, Sara is going to talk way more about it, but I'm just going to bring up this website called Encyclopedia. Uh, this is this is what it is called. It's again on the PowerPoint. All of that. The point I'm bringing this up is that these color codes are directly codable into R, which is kind of like pretty cool because anything under the world you want to do um, is going to color your points however you want, which is really great when you have like organisms that are a certain color and all that stuff. Does anyone have a color? Let's do our, we always start a color with a hashtag. That's just, you know, kind of like when you buy paint. Let's put that sweet, sweet egg yellow on there. And there she blows, kind of hard to see. But that's okay, because there are these different shapes we can use. So uh, the default shape, I think, is one. Let's do, a, so if we do color of a yellow, brilliant, we can fill, um, and I actually, we're just, I'm just going off the cusp right now, so I actually don't know what's going to happen. That didn't work, but that's okay. That's our, uh, <laughs> so we've got our color, we've got our fill. I think I'm going to do, is it 21? This is, oh God, if I can do this, it's gonna be super cool. 
There we go. Okay, so not great. As you can see, shape 21 is a filled circle. So the outside is a yellow <laughs> and the inside is black. So let's actually flip those around. We can fill it with black and flip that. Let's see if that works. Woo! <laughs> There you go, beauty of R, super fun to use. So shape 21 has a fill and a color component. So you can actually define the outside and the inside of a shape, which is really great when you have a stupid color like egg yellow <laughs> that like doesn't show up very well on, um, you know, graphs. So anyway, yeah, you can outline your colors too. Great, we've done that. Let's go farther. Let's do more. So what we're going to do now is we're going to, let's see here, we can also, so I'm going to actually uh, take, take these color things away. Um, just, we don't really, we don't need that right now. So let's, but you guys know how to do it. And that's, that's what's most important. So we can also color based on our data. So I'm going to bring this color actually up into my aesthetics up into you know the original data distributions. And I can say color based on wool. What do you think R is going to do? Well, R is actually pretty smart. Um, there are two colors of wool. These are the automatic colors. It always generates these colors. Um, and that's, that's fine. And so as you can see, cause I put the color uh, on the first aesthetic definition, it's then trickling down to coloring my jitter points and coloring our geome points. But let's say maybe I want some different colors and let's say I want to just um, define color just for the points, like not for the statistical summary points, but just for my data points. So to do that, we're actually gonna take the color of wool from the original aesthetics out and we're gonna add it just to the geome jitter because that's all we want it in. Now I'm gonna do something that maybe a lot of you guys just did, which is just pasting it here. Let's do that. And let, let me show you what happens because, well, you're gonna see. Um, wool is not found. And that makes sense because wool is not something that we haven't defined wool. R doesn't know what wool is. So um, we actually have to put it in our aesthetics and say, hey, like, Wool is in the data. Please color wool based on our data. And then that plot is going to run. And as you see, it's only going to color the points, those data points. Um, yeah, cool. Um, what you're gonna see here uh, on top, you're gonna see two black points here. And those look a little bit weird, right? Like that's not, that's not normal. Why are my points duplicated? Well, these are the points actually from the box plot. So these are the box plots outliers, and these are our jittered points from the box plot. So that's something to be really careful about. Uh, we can always put um, the outliers to the box plot. We can set it as false, which will remove those, but we're actually going to remove the box plots altogether. Um, and I will tell you why, uh, but first let's um, go through something a little more fun, in my opinion. The median is all fun and good, but we can do something a little more advanced in my opinion. I think you guys are ready for it. So we're gonna delete this function, goodbye. And we're actually gonna go to something called fun data. Yeah. Um, so fun data is uh, this kind of amendment that's attached through, through the hmisc package um, that we installed. And we're actually going to do um, instead of a median, we're going to do a mean. And what's so cool is that we can actually also pull the confidence limits and we can do this through, oopsie daisy, noink, through bootstrapping. As you guys maybe know, why am I so my stupid fingers? Uh, we can pull this bootstrap. Um, so what happens is that through repeated sampling of our vector of wool breaks, we can create a sample distribution and make something that's actually really accurate and pretty uh, scientifically like interesting to have both the mean and the confidence limits pulled from our vector of numbers instead of just like the median. So 
we're going to do something too. We're not going to stick with points anymore. We're going to now make it a point range. Point range is a point with the range, <laughs> the confidence limits there. And let's just, uh, well, let's, let's, you know, I want to be honest. Let's run all of it. Yeah, so doesn't look great, right? <laughs> That's okay. Uh, let's take out the box plot because it's getting a little confusing. Yoink. Great, so already things are looking better for us. Now, we've already defined the point as shape 21. This size now is, is kind of different. I think the size of three is like way too big. So let's just... I think 0.8 might, might look a little cuter. Let's see how that looks. That's a little better. Um, shit, maybe I'll go to one, I don't know. Yeah, it's better. Okay, so it still looks kind of whack though. Like, let's be honest, it doesn't look great. <laughs> but I remember the shape 21 has a fill and a color. So let's fill it because this transparent look is not cute. So let's fill it with, I think a classic white is just kind of a good way to go here. So we've got our point range. Look at that. It's already looking like much better than the box plot we were dealing with. And what's really cool is that you can see these confidence limits now um, really kind of tell a more interesting data story than what was being captured from the box plot. Because those whiskers who were just kind of like Bleh, and now we've really got the limits that look really cool. Okay, that's cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, what do we want to do? I think the y-axis is kind of like, can use some improvement. Um, I would really like a little bit more resolution on like 20, 40, 60, you know, what, what's happening here? You know, there's a lot of drama here. There's a lot of drama down here. So let's change the scale of our y-axis. So we're going to go scale, uh, y, and again, whoops, why do I keep doing that? Um, what do we have? What kind of variable is it? Well, it's continuous. So let's choose that one. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to define the number of breaks. And intuitively, we go to breaks. Cool. So now we're going to define the sequence. This requires a pretty basic knowledge of your data. So we can see our sequence goes from zero to like 60, let's say 70, 60, 65. Yeah, let's just say, let's just say 70. So zero to 70. Um, wait, sequence, because it is a sequence. Forget that. Uh, and then let's go by, by tens. That seems like a good thing to do. Sweetness, ta-da. So now you can see your y-axis is a little bit better in resolution. We could even go farther. I mean, let's just do it for, you know, the drama. You could, I mean, you could really, <laughs> <laughs> Let's not though, because like that's getting a little too crowded in my opinion, but just to show you, you know, your imagination, your vision, whatever you want. Cool. yo. So now um, I think we are going to go and start renaming some of these axes. Um, I think, first of all, um, let's, let's call these discrete variables. So A and B are not really, <laughs> they don't really mean anything to me. Um, so let's go to scale X, and this is uh, going to be discrete because it's a discrete variable. And then we're going to label uh, our factor levels. So we have wool, right? Um, what kind of wool do you guys want to have? Llama? That's a llama wool? That's a wool. I don't knit. I wish Cecile was here. She would tell me. Llama. Okay, I actually already made a mistake and you guys will learn from it. See, I have a space here. This space is coded into my name. So if I left that space there, I would always have to do space llama to, to call llama, but we're gonna delete that and make sure we're just including llama. <laughs> so I'm now calling A llama and let's call B like another type of yarn, acrylic, acrylic yarn. I also don't know how to spell acrylic. Acrylic. I don't know if that looks, I think that looks right. Anyway, <laughs> we named our factors llama and acrylic. 
Um, very nice. Good job, everyone. <laughs> now you probably want to also name um, your wool, like your X and Y axes, like the gross axes and not the fine ticks. So let's do that too. X lab is the X label label. Uh, let's just call it wool, but like with a capital. <laughs> goodness. So wool with a capital W because that's classy. And then let's call Y and let's call it number of times yarn yarn breaks and we'll define it as a count because you know what we're scientists but again if i made any spelling mistakes it would just print those spelling mistakes so make sure there aren't any okay so we've defined our variables we've defined this we can go a little bit farther here we're going to scale our colors so notice here i've colored the points you have the option between color and fill. We've started kind of messing around with color and fill um, <laughs> with our stat summary points with the egg yellow. That was brilliant. Um, and so just to show you guys, um, if I fill the points here, because the default um, is a shape that is actually, we're going to see what happens. Let's, let's see what happens. It doesn't work. And I will tell you why this makes sense because we filled it on a on a shape that doesn't have a fill definition. So the point shape here is like one or something. And so that doesn't have like a fill option. The only option in the like default set point shape is color. So if you've ever come into color versus fill problems, it's probably based on your point shape. You can also color and fill different graph types, which we will get into later. OK, so we've done all that. But again, I'm here for the color aesthetics. We are data visualizing pros. Let's change those, um, those colors. So we're going to go the scale color. Again, color, not fill, color and manual. Because you know what? We want to choose. Wow, what is that? That's wrong. There we go. OK, so first we're going to define our values, which are our colors values all right so again we're concatenating to oh also I, i've kind of been forgetting to say this but see i put a c here whenever i have a like a list going on um it just means you're concatenating you're tying them together so let's choose some colors um hmm i actually chose some colors that i thought were kind of cute before so you guys can just let's let's all type them together so you guys can get a little bit of a little taste of uh, my little brain. Um, these colors mean absolutely nothing like these codes. <laughs> we could also do like an easy color code like brown or yellow and R understands those colors. Actually, let's do that just, just for shits and giggles. Um, yeah, oh my God. So the R, the R colors are not fabulous. So like, you know, the yellow is going to be something R understands. Um, but you know, why not use something a little better if you can? So, uh, I know you guys are not, well, I am not living for the brown right now, but you'll see it's going to look cute. So those are the two colors I'd kind of chosen before. <laughs> Actually looking at them now, they don't look awesome, but, <laughs> but it's going to pan out and I just need a little bit of trust, please. Um, so, um, actually. I'm going to do that right now because maybe you guys are losing a little bit of <laughs> trust in me. I had mentioned that the color and fill thing um, are um, important for shape. So actually, let's change it to a shape that's going to use uh, the color and it's just going to color the outside. So we're going to add that to our geom jitter and let's just call it a one. That was that one shape that just does the outside. See, see how much better already way call way cuter. Um, someone asks, there are two functions, geom color and geom color, uh, you know, the, the British way of spelling it, they are completely equivalent. So if you want to say geom color <laughs> or geom color, like a normal person, it's fine. You'll also find later in your R career, they're summarized with a Z or a Z as they say, or summarize with an S. Again, equivalent. It's just so that the Americans are happy they added the non-U version. Sorry. Let's do it just to please the masses. Kalur. 
Oh my goodness, it still runs. Whatever, haters. Okay, so we've defined our values, but you might be seeing our legend is still kind of whack. And that's because our legend isn't talking to the rest of our plot. So let's tell our, let's tell our legend what's up. Uh, we are going to change the name of our legend. Uh, so just like the title of it. And let's call it wool types. Seems like a good, good one. So you're gonna see our legend title should change. It does, that's good. <laughs> and then again, we can change those factor, those factor labels. Um, so again, let's do that. Uh, and we said llama. <laughs> that is super wrong, llama. There's no H in llama? Wow, the more you know. Um, well, lahama is, <laughs> so we're just gonna call it lahama. <laughs> I have been spelling llama with an H my whole life. Where did that H come from? I don't know. But see, heart doesn't care. It's Lahama in acrylic. <laughs> there you go. Okay, well, this has been fun. Um, we're gonna add a little more drama to this. First of all, the theme of the gray background is classic GG plot, but very rarely what you actually want. So we're gonna change the theme and I tend to go with black and white. Um, I think it's classy, but you've got all these different kinds of themes that you can choose. Um, what this one does essentially is just makes the background white. Um, okay, other things we are going to do. Well, I was thinking, we did the stat summary, right? With these really cool uh, confidence, love confidence limits, yes. Um, and I thought, oh man, like I should probably tell them how to retrieve that information <laughs> if you want it. Um, and so that's, we're gonna do that. So to do that, we actually have to save our plot as an object. So we have to save this whole masterpiece that we are, we are currently creating. So let's just call it A. So I'm going to the top of the plot. I'm just saying, hey, this is an arrow. Actually, it's supposed to be an arrow. It says pointing to A, save my plot as A. That is what it is called. It is now a list. That is just like the data frame of the plot we have created. That's just how it goes. Um, so we can call A, whenever we call A, it's going to run that plot. And that can be good if your plot gets like really long <laughs> with a lot of like little things to it. You can always just call it, save it, do that. So um, we can actually go to a function called gg, whoops, gg build. Nope. What's it called? Oh yeah, gg plot <laughs> underscore build. So this is going to tell you how your plot was built. And we're going to put a in there because that is what we named our plot. And you get a ton, <laughs> a ton of stuff coming up on your console. Um, the answer is right here in data two. Um, this is like the stat summary that we've, we've made. So you can see the Y is that mean. And then the Y min and Y max are the, the limits of that confidence limit that was created using that bootstrap method. Um, if you want it a little bit tidier, you can then save this GG build again. We'll call it B. We're gonna do that. And then we can see B over here. And so we're gonna click on B and then you're gonna see it's gonna poop out B. And then you can go to your data. And again, uh, two rows with 14 columns. Sounds, sounds right, let's look at it. Aha, it's our table with all of our values. Uh, that R has generated for us using our statistical summary. Um, and so this, this can be good just to check that like the math was done right, all that jazz. Okay, so we've got that, that's okay. I think we gotta do one last little thing here. We're gonna flip this because sometimes you just need to flip, flip things. <laughs> So we're gonna do chord flip. Oh, and also it's not gonna run now until I tell it to, to do A. So now you're gonna see all the coordinates have been flipped. Kind of cool. Um, I'm gonna take this A away just for now because um, it's annoying to have to run it twice. 
And then also one little thing I like to do sometimes to highlight important data is just add a line. Uh, it's just like a, to just kind of make the comparison easier. Again, remember perceptual, is it obvious? So um, let's add a line between the mean of like each of these point ranges to really show that they're different. So we can do that by doing a geome and you can have a B line, B line, H line, kind of just depends if you want your line to be vertical or horizontal. So we're gonna do an H line here. And then we just define the Y intercept. Remember we have our data here. One was like 31.03. I'm just gonna copy it to be super exact. Uh, you don't need to do that. And you're gonna see again, at my plus, what happens? You get a line, cool. Um, this line is not very nice. So let's make it a little more subtle. We can change our line type. Let's do dashed. I think that's always really classy. And then also we can change the color. And again, I'm not working through AES, so I can set whatever color I want. Uh, not black, let's do light gray. Uh-oh, why is it mad at me? In Aha, uh -huh. dehashed, just like Lahama. <laughs> Goodness. There she blows. So a little more subtle. Maybe actually I'll go for gray. I think it's a little darker. It's a little more like a smoky eye. <laughs> Adding a smoky eye to your graph. We're going to add two of those, right? Because we have one line for uh, our Lahama, <laughs> and now we need one line for the other one. So this one should be 25 point whatever the hell. All right. Yoink, bam. And again, it's going over our point ranges. Why? Because we painted it after. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna move these before our point ranges. Where's our point range? Stat summary. So we're gonna actually put them over here so they're not getting in the way. Yoink, bam. And that my friends is the end of part one. <laughs> Let's get this party going. Um, so just to show you guys again, so now we're 46 lines of code deep. Um, just looking here like, hey, we can jump all the way back to the top. And then we can actually also look over here. So we're going to jump over here to part two. Um, we are now going to change it up. I'm going to be closing all of this warp breaks business. We don't need this in our lives anymore. Let's move on to the very famous data set, Iris. Oh my goodness, Iris. I'm actually gonna clear everything here too, uh, just so that you guys don't get confused. So Iris again, sweet, sweet promise. We open it up and it is much bigger, much better, much better. Um, we've got sepal links and sepal widths. Irises are flowers. There are three species. Let's ask, hey R, what's this iris business? Well, it's um, the famous like Fisher's or Anderson's iris data set. Um, it's pretty old. It's from, yeah, like 1936. Um, and so it's like one of the most classic data sets to work with. It's really fun because there's continuous and categorical variables that really allow you to, to drum up a lot of data drama. So yeah, we're gonna be playing with that right now. So again, let's plot, let's get plotting. Um, I'm gonna get rid of this. Uh, I'm gonna just create a little space here because I like working with a blank, blank strip. So GG plot, hello. Um, Iris, again, is our new data set. So let's, let's call Iris. Um, again, let's define our aesthetics. So we are gonna start, I will admit, I've like already messed around with this <laughs> and like already know what's gonna happen. So we're just gonna mess with something called sepal link. The length of your sepals. Goodness, there we go. Um, and then we are going to also be looking at uh, sepal width. Width. Lahama, I can't believe I did that. 
All right, and then we're going to color based on species. So we've kind of already talked about that. If you see here, we've got three levels, so we can expect three colors. Hope everything's adding up. I know biologists, like we're not super good at math, but like three should be good. Um, and then let's again, just start with our points. That's really kind of the best way to just see even like what we're working with here. Aha. <laughs> so very much um, some scatter plot um, vibes here. Um, so like, let's just keep on looking. It kind of looks like the Setosa species might be interesting. So um, yeah, let's just kind of make our plots and our points, you know, a little bigger, a little badder. So let's change the size again for my sight challenged uh, advisors. We're gonna do shape 21. It was Sada's birthday yesterday, so, you know. Uh, and we're gonna change the alpha to like we did last time. Um, and we're gonna set it to 0.4. Let's just see what happens. Okay, so that's a little bit clear. Um, <laughs> huh. Okay, you know what I'm gonna do? Uh, I'm actually gonna change this to shape 16. I know these shapes in my head, which is like pretty sad. Um, but, but yeah, so shape 16 is a filled, um, filled circle. So that's, that's looking a little bit better. Um, we could actually, you know, no, we're not. We're just going to stay on the straight and narrow. Let's name our axes. Uh, so Y lab, again, anything here is going to be what it poops out. So we're going to call it sepal width. And because we're scientists, let's put those units up there. And we're going to name the X lab as well. And that is going to be called sepal length centimeters because we are scientists. Great. Not great. Great. Yes, great. Um, I'm going to move the theme right now to black and white uh, just because this gray just nauseates me. Why is this running so slowly? There we go. OK, so. Now we are going to have some serious fun. We are going to add some regression lines to your plot. And regression lines um, are wonderful, but with great power comes great responsibility. And we will talk about them ad nauseum. So regression lines are made with something called stat smooth. You could also use geome smooth. So actually geome and stat, like color and color, are completely interchangeable. I like to use stat smooth because it really defines the differences between like the shapes I'm making and the math I'm doing. If that makes sense. So we can give, um, first of all, a method. So what kind of fit do we want to use? Um, for the sake of life, we are going to be using just a GLM, which is a general generalized linear model. And we could actually also use an LM, so just a linear model. We could use low S, which uh, we will do just for fun later. And that uses uh, the next squared means. It kind of fits based on the previous point. Um, we also have to define a formula. So again, uh, we, will, we will very much mess around with this. But first, let's just do a classic you know, linear model. Oopsie daisy. Um, boink. Uh, so the tilde is y, so y is predicted by x, very like standard model output. So let's just run this now. And so we're seeing some straight lines and they are being fit by each species because we said to look at each color of the species. So it's really dividing up within those three colors. Now, I want to want to talk about a little bit of the things we can do. So first of all, you can use regression lines to predict where your data might go. So if we say full range, so this is then using the full range of the graph, not the full range of your data. And we set that to true, so set it to T. Let's run that code again and see what happens. Um, my goodness, it's going quite slow. Um, anyway. As you can see, it's going to go past your predicted data to fit the full range of all of the data points. This can be super misleading and very dangerous to do, especially when you don't know like what your data is about. It kind of 
echoes back to the enscomb, uh, you know, the quartet of like, oh yeah, like let's just fit a regression line. They all fit the same, very dangerous to do. So I really recommend do not do that. So we're gonna set that to false because, you know, we don't want, we don't want to go anywhere we're not supposed to go. Um, the other things you can do is that you can change this formula to whatever you dare do. Um, you could do the log of X if you're fitting like a log function. Uh, let's see what happens there. Um, and so then you're going to see like there's going to be a curve starting to form. Uh, you can do a polynomial. I'm really showing you guys everything to know what you can do, but like, please, please be careful. Um, so you can fit a polynomial, like a cubic polynomial, and you can force R to like do whatever you want. Like you can, you can really start getting some weird stuff, you know, and be like, oh, uh, I fit like a quadratic polynomial onto my like very clearly like linear data set, you know? So <laughs> the point of this is not to like fit the most complex fucking, sorry, hacking, not, you don't do this <laughs> unless you've done your statistical model first, you know your model's correct and you're like, all right, let's, let's apply that. So we are going to not do this. Like these are options, you know, and sometimes maybe you will have quadratic data that you need to fit, but like, let's be honest, you probably don't. And <laughs> you just put your X and move on with your life. Okay. Here's another honesty thing we have to get through, which is a very easy hole to fall into. Um, and it's like zooming into your data. So let's say like very clearly, we can see like Satosa, like something's happening with that species, right? And let's say we wanna zoom in and just look at Satosa. You never, ever, ever, do this. So let's say we want our X limb, so our X limits to be between five and 5.5, right? We're just zooming in to this like box. This is what's gonna happen, right? You're like, oh, great. Everything's awesome. No, nothing is awesome. Look at your warning messages respect the warning messages. You have removed 113 points. That's fine, you zoomed in. But now you've removed 113 rows containing missing values. So what has happened here is that your regression line is now calculated for the points that are showing up. So it's not just zooming in, it's completely recalculating, right? And this is a problem because now it's only calculating this regression line based on this subset of data. To uh, prove my point again, just for teaching sake, we're gonna remove, we're, we're just gonna pretend this excellent didn't happen. And we're gonna go by low S, which is a fit that uses the like closest nearest point. So they tend to be really squiggly and kind of silly, but like, let's pretend this is like the correct way to do this, right? And then we kind of see, these relationships, and then we zoom in using xlim. And these, this is, this bump did not exist before, because now this bump is just fitting these data. Do you see the problem here? Big problem. So we never, ever, ever, <laughs> I can't like say this enough, use xlim. That's the no-no, that's the no-no code. Instead, we're going to use chord Cartesian. Oh, music to my ears. So chord Cartesian now is just going to be zooming in in that Cartesian coordinate plane, that 2D plane. Now watch what happens when I zoom instead of rescale. Oh my goodness, how different are the data? Because this time we just zoomed. We didn't rescale the entire model fit. Got it? I hope you got it. Do not use this ever or I'll find you. All right, I hope I've made myself 
painfully clear here. Turns out we actually don't really need this <laughs> in the plot we're making today. I just really wanted to kind of give you like the don't do drugs, uh, don't use Xlim uh, <laughs> situation. So yeah, we're just gonna fit the just generalized linear model again. Let's go back to that. Um, cool, so we can be back in fun, fun time now. So sometimes when you have data that look like this, you can think, huh, wouldn't it be kind of cool to separate this like versicolor and the virginica data sets because they're kind of like on top of each other. I can't really see what's going on. And a way to get around this is using facet wrap. Okay, and we're gonna facet wrap based on, so facet, it's like, you know, faceting, it's making smaller parts of a whole. And so we wanna facet based on species because those are the categories we're interested in. So again, we're gonna use that tilde and we're gonna define species and we're gonna run it. Wait, we're gonna add our plus because we do that. We're gonna run it. And this is what it looks like. And like, that's kind of fun, right? Like we can kind of see what's going on here. Um, one thing that can get kind of annoying is that there's like a lot of white space here um, that's not super cute. And so one way to get around that is that you fit the facet based on the X or Y limits of each species. So one way to do that is to mani manipulate the scales. So if you do scales are free, what will happen is that now each of the regression lines are going to be completely centered. Um, so you'll see now these x axes. Yeah, these x axes are now different based on the different components of of what that data range is existing in. Um, you can also just manipulate a y or the x axis. So let's say we do free x. That's going to force all of them to stay on the same y axis, so a common y axis, and then just let the x ones be free. Um, this is, can be really good if you're really just trying to com uh, compare on a single axis, saying, like, oh, this is really, you know, the big change here is happening on the y axis. Let's keep that common. Because remember, humans are best at comparing on a common scale. So using that common scale from the y axis can be a pretty good, pretty good workaround. All right. So we actually are almost done with our second part. We are just gonna go now to, we're going to kind of pimp out this plot. Let's go. So as you can see, these facet boxes, the color, it's kind of like not cute at all. So we can actually change everything, <laughs> like really everything. Let's first of all change uh, the font. I think that I think this is like uh, Helvetica or whatever. Uh, let's just change the family to times. You know, times is classic. It's it's time. It's timeless. Ah, uh, here all day. So this is going to change the the text for everything. Everything is changed. Change text everywhere. Now we added this to our first theme because we want it to be everything. Um, now. If you want, uh, we've got our base theme again. Um, we're going to now do a more specific theme so we can now make our own custom theme based on very specific things we wanna change. So let's talk about all the fun things we can do. Um, so let's talk about legend position. Um, I don't want a legend. I think this is kind of redundant because we already have all the information here. So we're gonna say our legend position is none. Let's run that up. Oh. Um, okay, let's talk about other things. These axis titles, uh, one thing I usually always do is I make them bigger because again, you know, old advisors. So we're gonna change the element text. So the, the like, the text of the axis. So like when I think about designing a theme, I'm just like kind of building like an increasingly specific map in my head. Uh, you can write this down. And like what I would usually do is like write down, okay, axis, axis title, element text. So it's, it's getting increasingly specific. 
Um, so for this element text, I want the size to be uh, 12. Um, just so it's nice and nice and big. And like, you can make this honestly, like just for just for kicks, like let's make it 20. <laughs> like, ooh. Yeah, you can make it really big <laughs> if you want to. Um, you can also, uh, within this element text, kind of imagine you're in a word processor. So you can do like anything that word can do. So you can also type, change the face of it. So we can make it bold, you know, just really for those heart of vision <laughs> advisors, you know, big text, bold text, um, what else? You can also change the color. You know, I love that. I love that so much. I have a color that I saved here. I don't know what it's gonna look like. So let's look together. It's orange. There you go, just for you. Um, Coolio, what else can we do? Well, the list goes on. Talk about, so I'm gonna set this back to 12, you know, just get back into some some normal talks here. You can also uh, change uh, what is called the strip. So this strip of text. Um, so we're gonna, again, so notice here that for every kind of um, element I'm doing, I'm really giving it its own line so that everything I've manipulated to that specific element is kind of grouped together. So everything I did to the axis titles, I'm leaving here and then I'm starting a new little line here to talk about the strip uh, strip stuff. So let's talk about strip stuff. Uh, we've got the strip background. So like the background color, right? Um, and so there we're talking, so there are different elements uh, which we so we dealt with the element of text on our axis. Now we're going to be actually so you see all of these elements are here. We're going to be dealing with an element of rect, which is a rectangle. <laughs> so we're going to be editing this rectangle element. So let's click on that. And again, you can change everything you want. Um, so you know, you can fill so again, remember the color versus fill. So in this rectangle, the color is going to be the outline and the fill is going to be the inside filled part. So um, I'm filling my, my rectangle with another color, FFF7E5. I don't know why I did this. I think I just wanted to show you like how customized you can, you can go. Uh oh, strip background. Oh, and it's called stip, not strip. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> Let's see, read yours. Oh, look, actually, to the person who wanted the egg color, this is actually quite egg, eggy. So there you go. So you can fill it. Also, you can change the line type of your rectangle. Again, I'm not saying this is like nice looking. <laughs> I'm just saying you can do it, um, which is like, you know, the point here. I'm not saying to do it, but you can do it. And isn't that what life's all about? Um, okay, so we have changed the strip background. We can also, uh, again, change the strip text. I mean, I don't know how detailed, like, I feel like, you know, at this point, you guys kind of get it. Like, we can just really, <laughs> let's see here, strip, uh, strip text. Yeah, and then you could even do, you know, text on the Y, text on the X, but we only have text here. So again, let's just, you know, why not? We're here, we're all, and, and you're gonna see a lot of these elements actually start repeating themselves, right? So the strip text, let's make it bigger for our old advisors. Let's set it to a size of 12. Let's again, make it nice and bold, a lot of drama. Um, and let's just see what happens there. Boink, there you go. Um, again, you can change the color, <laughs> do anything you want. Um, God, this guy is so ugly. <laughs> Now that I'm looking at it, I'm like, this is really, but you've learned something. You've learned something. And that's what, that's what it's all about here. Um, like, do we want to fix it? <laughs> I don't know. I'm honestly kind of embracing this, um, this whole vibe. Um, <laughs> this is what it looks like. You know, you ever, for those of you in your PhD, sometimes you just look at your data and you're like, well, <laughs> This is where we are now. Can I change what's written inside of the rectangles? Absolutely. Oh man. Well, guess we're already here. 
let's do it. Um, so that, so we did use the, um, the X, uh, remember in the first plot, we used the scale X discrete, and then we named those. That is like a quick and dirty way of doing it. And actually the best way to change um, the, you know, to capitalize those letters, I would say is actually manipulating your original data set to make sure your data are actually matching um, what, what you want the words to be. <laughs> so uh, one thing we can do here is we can, do you guys wanna just do it the quick and dirty way? Let's do it the classy way, just so that you guys have, I'm just gonna call it like classy way of renaming variables. And this is where the Dippler um, package comes in. So we're again gonna call Iris. And one way to look at Iris is that you can then call a certain, you know, you see all these columns come up and we have species. So we're gonna call species, bam, and we're gonna recode it. So we just go through this thing called recode. You go through Iris, you call species again, right? And so now you get to rename all the species because you're just recoding it. Um, this is, I think, the cleanest way of doing it. Um, and again, I would do this at the beginning of my, um, my R code to make sure everyone can see what I'm doing and not hiding anything. Um, but this is kind of, you can do it the quick and dirty way like I showed you in the first plot. Um, but I think doing it here is better. And you can also do a lot of other things with Dippler. Um, Virgin, Virginica, yeah. And Virginica. All right, so this should be recoding my iris species. I look here, they are all capital letters now. I can rerun this plot with my new iris species. Yoink, there it is. And those are now capital letters. Okay, so that is that we are, Okay, so we've read in this image. Um, we the next thing we need to do is just uh, we need to. So right now, well, actually, now you can see it's this giant array. Uh, so that's not actually a picture. Uh, we're gonna name it. Um, so we're gonna save it actually as something else as well, and we're gonna use this function called Oopsie Daisy. Uh, we're gonna use this function called Grid. And grid is part of one of the packages that you guys installed. And you can see this grid graphics package. Uh, when we use two colons, that means that we're opening up the package. We're like looking, we're taking a little peek inside of the package. We often do this sometimes when you have packages that have similar function names. So for example, uh, example, for example, uh, Dippler and the tidyverse or uh, tidy, tidier, have a lot of functions that are a similar name. You've got summarized that are in both of them. So sometimes packages share names. And so to make sure the call is coming from the right package, sometimes you define the package as coming from like we did with grid. So from grid, we're gonna actually call this function called raster grob. So uh, grob <laughs> is, I really didn't name this, but it is a graphical object. It's a gr -ob graphical object and our graphical object in this case is an image. So we're gonna call image and we're also going to interpolate, which means that it, now <laughs> image one, I one is now like written as an image, um, which is good because before it was a really giant array that we didn't really know what that meant. So we can kind of forget about that for right now and move on to our last plot of the workshop. So let's get into it. We're again working with our iris data set. We're going to define our aesthetics. Again, setting our x, um, let's call our x species, and our y, let's change it up a bit. We're going to be working with petals this time. We're going to go to petal length. All right, and so let's just call that, make sure we're all on the same page here. Right, there it is. Nothing's on it, that's fine. We're going to do 
something a little different this time. We're gonna be looking at density distributions because I think they are the unsung heroes of the graphical world. So we're actually gonna use violin plots. And so violin plots are showing the distribution of a, of a continuous distribution. Um, and we're going to, well, let's just paint them first. Those are our base violin plots. Probably not like the cutest plot you've ever met in your life, which is okay, but you can already see that there's a totally different distribution uh, of these lengths based on these species. So it's already kind of fun to be looking at them. Let's make them a little bit cuter. So <laughs> let's fill them with a light gray color. And then let's actually, so we're filling, remember, but then we can also color because violins have an outline and a color inside. So we're gonna color based on our aesthetics. So based on our data frame, and we're gonna color based on species because that makes sense. Let's run that, see what we're looking at here. So as you can see, the color in this case is doing the outline. The fill is that we're filling in these violin plots. Uh, that's that. We can also um, just you know, change some other things about it. We can change the size of your violin plots. Again, everything in ggplot is completely customizable. We can change our alpha. So again, remember our, our alpha is our opacity. So let's make it a little thinner and a little clearer. And already you're seeing um, a much different, maybe a little bit um, finer expression um, of, of your plot. Um, just to visualize this a little bit better, let's change that base theme to a nice uh, black and white. Very nice. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring you guys to a little a little thing I like to call uh, Geom Cena. So Geom Cena is um, plotting your points, taking into account the density distribution of your data. So what this means is that your data points are actually going to fit within your density distribution. Pretty cool, right? So again, we can change these black dots. They are not looking great. So let's change this aesthetics and let's time, whoopsie daisy. Let's change it to um, fill. And again, remember the points because these like standard theme points, uh, you just fill them entirely. So let's fill them again based on species. Or not. Hmm. We'll, get, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. I wonder why it's on. Let's go, let's, well, shit. Let's color them then. Yoink. Well, there you go. Whenever that happens. All right. So again, let's let's kind of change what we're dealing with with uh, just like the, the color, the opacity, the size. Let's just change it all. We're making them a little bigger. We're making them a little lighter. Um, oh yes. So again, well, let's run this. Cool. Like looking pretty cute, actually. I gotta say, pretty impressed with us. Right on. So. Um, let's add some, some custom colors <laughs> and let's not make them awful this time. This time I'm going to stick to what I had planned out the first time. So we're going to add our scale color manual because again, we're manually coloring these points. Again, going into assigning values, we are concatenating several values. Now I'm going to go and again, you guys can color whatever the heck you want. This is what I had chosen. Let's hope it's not that awful <laughs> color I chose last time. I don't know what I was thinking, but you know, I don't have a design degree. I have a degree in biology. Not as, not as useful. BE 378. Uh, okay, so these are the colors I chose. Let's see what they look like. <laughs> I forgot. See that, is that not so cute? I will admit my green points are kind of getting washed out. So I might go to my alpha and kind of uh, bump it up a little bit just so it's a little more opaque. Ooh, you know what we should do? We're gonna do this. So <laughs> we're gonna change our shape. 
um, to 21, because remember the 21 has the outline and that's good for colors that get a little bit washed out. And now we're gonna fill species instead of, there we go. Um, and so now, ho ho, so we've changed the fill because we wanted the outline, that's all cool. But see how my custom colors went away? Trauma, why? Why did they go away? Because you use scale color instead of scale fill. That's right. So I need to change this to fill now. Yay! Ta-da! <laughs> Coolio. So we've done that. Let's just do our like basic, you know, like I think it's good to go through this a couple of times. So like, again, let's just, you know, name our y-axis. Uh, that's a title link. Oopa. All right. So something has happened. Oh, okay. So, well, you know, you're learning with me. That's fine. Um, so I filled the um, the the colors, uh, but I also need to color for the scene plot for the violin distributions. So actually, I need to both fill and color. You can see here, like see how the violins are actually still the standard colors. So yeah, we actually want to fill and color custom. And now it should work. Nice. All right. Well, I like like having these issues and then we can solve them together. Uh, just shows you that coding is a living, breathing animal. Okay. Now we're going to do the super fun custom stuff and then we'll be done. So one thing that you probably want to do is add significant stars because like that's a thing don't do this again without doing the stats first you don't just get to like slap them on there right so like with great power great responsibility don't do this without your stats being confirmed first um so again we are going to now open up gg signif that is that package we are opening it up um, and so once we open it up, we're actually going to use um, geome signif. It's just the geome. And we are going to do a comparison. So we are going to compare in a list. And again, we are going to concatenate. So we are going to compare, let's compare Versicolo to Satosa. These guys, in my opinion, if I were to do statistics in this case, I'd probably see a difference. So we are going to say uh, ver. Genica and uh, Satosa. And um, we are going to map the significance level and we're gonna put it true. So let's make sure all of my parentheses are closed. Say a little prayer. Ayo, nice. Um, so that is how to add stars. Oh, we can do this again. You can just, man, you could just ride this till the end of time. Let's do it again. Um, and this time, again, I think Satosa is kind of the star of the show here. Um, let's do versicolor. Yep, let's run that. Aha. Uh -huh. Interesting. Oh, oh, here's what. Okay, wait. So, again, active learning. So this is mapping on the same axis as the previous one, <clears throat> which is kind of confusing, right? <laughs> so what we can actually do is that we can bump it down uh, just by def defining where we want these stars to show up. So we can actually change uh, the Y position and we can change it to five. Like we want it lower, like I just want it lower. So I'm just gonna say like five and a half. So let's bump it down. Been nice. And you might say, Chloe, like, how did you just know that? And I could say, because I'm awesome, but the true answer to that is I had actually Googled how to do this before and asked our, how do I like offset these? So like, for example, I do question mark, uh, G, G, Sig, like I just, this, like, please help me R. 
how do I do this? And so then I like looked at it. And so then once I like have pulled this up, and so this really comes to like when you feel more comfortable with R, these things can really start, you know, helping you uh, decide how to do it. So like, for example, we have different tests we can define, like it added the stars, but then we can, you know, add them manually or actually define a test. Um, and then, so actually what I had found here was that Y position. And so then I said, okay, Y position, like I kind of want to change where that is. I go to Y position, the numeric vector with the Y positions of the brackets. So again, um, a lot of these things, the, the, the code is designed for you to have these questions naturally. And hopefully the developers have kind of predicted the most intuitive questions you're going to have um, and just like, you know, how to, how to fix that. So if you have a question for R, just ask R. All right, back to our plot. You guys, I can't, I just can't believe we're almost, we're almost done. So now we're gonna add a picture, yo, let's do it. I just can't believe it. <laughs> we made it. Um, we are going to use something called annotation custom. And we do this kind of to add, uh, you can add text, you can add random objects, images, rectangles, whatever you want. So we're going to use annotation custom. And we are going to add our picture, which we called I1. So let's just run it as is. <laughs> and you're going to see that <laughs> R doesn't really know <laughs> what, you know, why would R know where to put the iris picture? It doesn't. So you, you might need to do a little trial and error here. And thankfully for you, I actually already have. So I'm going to define my uh, Y and X kind of limits here. So this is, you know, again, you just kind of, you, you, this will become more intuitive, but this is actually, going to be where in the y and x axis this is showing up. Um, so through a little bit of uh, time and love, uh, this will become more intuitive. I cheated and did this before we met today. <laughs> and there it is. All right, so you guys, <laughs> we did it. I can't believe it. We are, but R is all about like having fun. And it's a really creative community that's out just have a good time. Um, there is this library called GG Bernie. Someone made a geome of Bernie Sanders. Um, I'm just gonna run it just so you guys, like it's based on this iris data. I thought it was gonna be like really intuitive and fun. So I'm actually just gonna run it right now, just so you guys can see. Um, yeah, I, I load my, my GG Bernie. Okay, I load my GG Bernie. Hopefully, um, this will run. This is again code. I I'm just copying and pasting it because I already did it. But it's on the um, here we go. It's on our Oikos workshop. If you like want to work through it and um, see it. Um, <laughs> so I colored different Bernie Sanders pictures based on our flowers that we used today. Uh, just to show you the absolute, just like creative amazingness that people, you know, have on R. There's so many fun packages. Um, as I mentioned in the lecture, R is all about building packages, looking for what you need, installing it, and really just kind of making a, the hive that you need uh, to obtain what you want. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for coming and learning and I hope that you took something away from this. Um, if you really enjoyed uh, this process, then please come and check out this second part of the workshop. Uh, it's hosted by Sara Hauchevar and she will be posting her part of the YouTube uh, workshop soon. Um, I'll definitely link it below once it's available. Uh, for now, if you want to access any of the code or even the PowerPoint slides from the first part, uh, feel free to check out my GitHub, everything is on there. And yeah, stay plotty and keep coding. See you soon.